Hello and good morning or afternoon, depending upon your time zone. I'm Dave Rubenstein, Editor-in-Chief of SD Times, and I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Five Ways to Optimize Developer Output with Automated Code Analysis. If you're still trying to get the most out of your automated testing, this webinar presents the myths, facts, and five best practices to squeeze as much as you can out of code analysis tools. Uh, before we start the program, I have a couple of quick brief announcements. Uh, there'll be a live Q&A uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, but you can ask a question anytime by going to the control panel, typing the question into the questions tab, hitting submit, and we'll uh, try to get to as many as we can as time allows. Uh, secondly, this uh, presentation will be available on demand on the sdtimes.com website. Uh, in about a day or so, and you can uh, watch it over and over again to your heart's content, uh, totally on demand. Okay, I would like to introduce today's speaker. It's Rod Cope. He's CTO of Rogue Wave Software, who's uh, sponsoring this uh, event today. Uh, Rod was the founder and CTO of OpenLogic and joined Rogue Wave as its CTO following the acquisition. He has over 20 years of experience in software development, spanning a number of industries, including telecom, aerospace, healthcare, and manufacturing. And now I'll let him take it away. Uh, Rod, good morning. All right, good morning, Dave. Thanks for the introduction. So this morning we're going to talk about how static and other code analysis uh, can help. So we'll start by looking at a, a brief history of testing, to see where we came from and, and kind of where we're going, then dive into static code analysis uh, specifically and why it helps, where it can help, and where it's really not a good fit, where it's uh, kind of out of scope. And then we'll look at five best practices to put static code analysis uh, in, in play in your organization to maximize developer productivity, to help with security and, and compliance. And then, as Dave mentioned, we'll follow up with some Q&A. All right, so let's jump right in. So first, a quick look at the history of testing. So in the in the early days, back when, when I got started, you know, testing was really the same as debugging. Right? You, as a developer, you wrote your code and you made sure it worked by running it, fixing bugs, running it again. And you kind of rinsed and repeated and, until you thought it was about right. You, know, you, you basically debugged. You didn't write your own test. You just ran the code. Then along comes something called unit testing, and, and it got people really excited about 20 years ago where a developer now would say, okay, well, and instead of just automatically or you know, kind of assuming that my tests, my, my code is good when I run it myself and debug it, I'm going to write something called unit tests and make sure that, that my individual blocks of code do what they say they're going to do. And that really took off and got a lot of developers excited to write unit tests and to see the lights turn green and know that the code was good. But that's, that's not really enough when you're doing it by hand. So then we move more into agile and, and extreme programming and, and into the realms of continuous integration and we realize that you've got to automate everything. Your unit tests and functional tests and integration tests, basically anything that can could possibly go wrong needs to be tested with an automated uh, tool. Right. Otherwise, you can't move fast enough in today's market with time to market pressure. It just takes too long to do things by hand. You can't rely on a, a QA department to do things by hand. All of it's got to be automated, including UI testing. Then along comes something called DevOps, where we kind of take it to the next level of, okay, well, the, the code itself is being tested now, but what about the infrastructure and the environment that code runs in? How do we make sure that the the database is up and running and the web servers and application servers are configured properly and are clustered the right way. So when we deploy our code, it works as well in production as we think it's going to work when we have it uh, proven out in QA. So that's, that's kind of the spectrum where we've, we've come through. But nothing is perfect, right? You, you, you can't make sure that there's no human error involved. So if developers are writing code and they're also writing tests, they can make mistakes when they write the tests, and even though the tests run and say everything is fine, maybe there's a mistake in the test where it didn't actually look at the right thing. And so it says, yep, this works, when really the code still doesn't work. Or there's software issues, right? 
that could be a software issue with some component in your stack, whether it's open source or commercial proprietary code or the operating system itself. There are bugs in all software so that you can, again, think that, that your testing is catching everything, but really it's not because there's some, some other glitch in the software stack that's masking a problem. It can also be hardware issues, bugs with uh, memory and, um, and drives with corrupt data. Lots of things can kind of conspire against us in the software world to make it look like things work when they don't always work, especially at, at high scale. And there's also the challenges that, that kind of come in with today's modern development. As I mentioned, higher time to market pressure. We have to get more done faster, and that just continues to accelerate. The applications themselves get more and more complex as users come to demand more features, more power. Um, they want it on their mobile device. They want it on their desktop, on their laptop. They want it in the cloud, in behind the firewall. So the software keeps getting larger and more, more powerful and therefore harder to test and harder to, to have control over all the code that's going into your applications. And as I mentioned, increased use of open source. We're seeing upwards of 80 to 90 percent of applications nowadays are open source, right? Uh, and that's a lot of code that you didn't write. So how well was it tested? Um, how, how well do you know that code when something goes wrong? So there's a lot of challenges. So we'll kind of talk about uh, going forward, how do we address some of these challenges? But first, we've got a poll question. So we've got a poll. What is the primary method you use to verify code? Are you doing manual code reviews? Are you writing unit tests? Are you creating manual tests during build time, or running manual tests at build time? Are you automating those tests whenever you build? Or are you automating all the testing with continuous integration tools so it happens every time developers check in code? We'll let this run for about 30 seconds give people a chance to respond. I see the, the results are coming in uh, pretty quickly. So if you're online, okay, I think we've got the results. You know, I think that's really interesting, uh, Rod, just to interject for a second. Um, you know, the, the, the common thinking is that people were doing fewer manual code reviews because of the time constraints uh, of, of testing and, and getting software released, uh, you know, in this agile world. But yet many of the people here are, in fact, still doing manual code reviews. I think that's interesting. Yeah, that is really interesting. I think, I think we have an honest set of attendees today. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I think um, you know, with all the, the, the talk and pressure out there around continuous integration and, and automating all the tests, I think a lot of a lot of people say, yeah, we, we've got to do that. But the reality is not everybody's there yet. And uh, it, takes, it takes time to write all those automated tests, especially if they've been neglected over time. But that is interesting to see uh, a third of people say, really, it's, it's manual code reviews is how we do it. And only a fifth, less than a fifth, are saying automated through CI. So that's, I guess that's good. We have some opportunities to improve. Let's, let's, let's uh, look at the glass half full. How's that? That's great. <laughs> okay. So thanks for responding to that. I think that's, that's good. It sounds like the, the group we have is a, a good fit for this webinar to talk about how we can, how we can uh, take advantage of some of those opportunities to do better. Okay. So looking at static code analysis in particular, first let's talk about what it is because there's some misconceptions, I think, uh, out there. Uh, about what it is and how it works. So, you know, the analysis of computer code, either source or object code, performed without actually executing programs. That's how we define static code analysis, as opposed to dynamic code analysis, which is about looking at the run time of code. And a lot of people think static code analyzers, well, it's just a glorified compiler, right? Is it, does my compiler do everything those static code analysis tools do? Well, 
it turns out they're actually quite a bit more complex. Uh, whereas compilers will really look at each each file and, and say, okay, was well, the code syntactically correct? A, a modern static code analysis tool is going to look at deep interprocedural and intermodule issues across the entire code base to make sure, for example, that uh, one function that calls another function located in another file is passing the right kinds of arguments with the right kind of values in the expected ranges of that function that's going to be called so that it doesn't cause a failure. Uh, those are the kinds of very complex uh, analysis they do. We'll look at lots more examples coming up. Another myth is that uh, SEA is just for junior developers, right? That, that more senior developers don't really need hand-holding. Really, it helps all developers become more effective because, you know, again, with these modern tools that, that look at hundreds and hundreds of, of problem areas across the entire code base, uh, including all the legacy code that your developers might not have written that could be around for years and years uh, and give quick results, it's really going far beyond what really a, a human developer is able to achieve. If you think about your developers, even your best developers sometimes uh, get tired or get sick or they've had too much caffeine or not enough caffeine and, and bugs creep in where static uh, code analyzers are, are always awake and alert and, and they're looking at all the code, not just uh, the interesting bits. And the third kind of big myth is that, well, this is testing, and testing is for QA, not developers, to do. Yeah, yes, it is testing of, of a sense in a, in a sort, but it's really about getting the bugs fixed before they happen. It's, it's about fixing errors even before a developer checks in the code into the build. It's finding and automatically pointing out here's security and quality issues and prevent them from being checked in versus finding them after they've made it into the code base. It's a lot cheaper, uh, more efficient, faster to get things fixed if you prevent the issue versus trying to find it and fix it later. So as an example, this is a non-technical example to make it kind of simple for everybody to understand the concept. It's kind of like a spelling or grammar checker in a, in a modern word processor. Right? If you type he went to the store, and you have a lowercase on that H, well, that's a defect. You know, he should be capitalized. So to fix it, you capitalize the letter. That's a very simple example, right? And that's, you could say, well, that's the kind of thing my compiler would catch. But really, we look at more sophisticated things, like Sally purchased two baskets of fruit at the store. When she got home, she put the three baskets of fruit on the counter. Well, of course, the defect is she only got two baskets of fruit. She can't put three of them on the, count on the counter, right? And so that's the kind of thing that would also be found by a static code analysis type tool that's looking not just at individual sentences in this case or files in the in the in the software world but across them and to understand the the intent and the expectations and the semantics of each of those sentences and how they compare and and look for issues that come up only when they're they're put together that's the kind of things that that static code analysis can do. So how does it work? And we'll come back around to the specific things it does in software, how, what, what it can fix in the next slide. But, but how it works is it's basically essentially writing and executing tests that developers either don't or won't write by looking at every line of code in the system. Right? So that means it does need to look at source code right? because it has to be able to compile that source code the same way your compiler would so it understands all those uh, include directories and compiler flags so that it's it's actually looking at the same results your compiler would provide so that you know you're inspecting the right code in the right way. If you do static code analysis without being able to have it understand how the code is compiled, you're going to get a, a lot of uh, issues that you'll have to address later. So it's got to compile the code. And that doesn't require any changes to your build flow. It can be completely seamless. And, uh, and automatic. Now, the, it does a lot of different types of analysis. The way it does that is it walks every path of your code, every every possible um, parameter value for all the, the functions and methods and all the conditionals, all the if, then, else statements and all the loops, and it looks at all the values and, and all those flows 
to make sure that there's, there's no problems inside a file, across methods, across all the files. So some of the things it can find are buffer overflows, the most common issue still, and this is for probably 20 years running, and the number one issue that causes lots of the headlines you'll hear about, things like heart bleed and, 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 chudle, and, and poodle and shell shock and lots of these kinds of uh, issues that come up again and again, uh, many of them are driven by buffer overflows, and that leads to security exploits, program crashes, data corruption, uh, theft of data, all kinds of bad stuff. Uh, no pointer dereferences that, that cause program crashes, you know, memory leaks, uninitialized data access, data usage, uh, even security specific issues uh, like privilege escalation where you, you have simple access to the system and you can find a vulnerability that gives you super user access or, or even multi-threading issues around concurrency, you know, deadlock detection. Those are the kinds of things static analysis, code analysis can do. So they, they find the vast majority of complex issues in code. They can also help on more of the, on the business side of things with standard compliance to make sure that all the code that's written by your organization complies with your own internal policies. Maybe that's around um, uh, style guides and things like that, or critical security and quality issues that, that have been uh, created as part of your own compliance policies. Or it could be industry standards you need to comply with, regulatory standards, uh, things like MISRA in the automotive space or OWASP for web applications or ISO 26262 in, in functional safety uh, environments. It can help prove that your code is compliant, that you've, you've gone through all the checks and that you've got a, a clean bill of health and can help you report on that. And again, that's code quality, security, and safety all can, can take in, be taken into account. So if you look at traditional testing versus static code analysis, in the traditional testing, when you're writing unit tests and functional tests, etc., you have to perfectly reproduce the runtime conditions uh, that caused an issue to occur in order to find it in that test. So the developers have to really know exactly how that code works at runtime uh, and then be able to exercise that code with the exact perfect set of parameters and arguments and, and flags, etc., which is very time consuming. And even if you spend the time there's no guarantee that you'll be able to trigger the actual defect uh, in runtime. It's just it's combinatorial explosion of parameters uh, can make it essentially impossible to do by hand. Static code analysis helps by finding those those things that aren't easy to spot with the human eye. Right. So not only can it automatically run all of its tests against all the lines of code with all the parameters because it's it's automated through code. Um, it can also find things that even if you do these code reviews by hand, which which we got from our poll that about a third of our attendees are doing, you can find things that, that really humans are not going to be able to easily see, right, that are very prone to be missed. Um, in, in dynamic testing, if you do that, Again, typically by hand, it's good, but it really only finds bugs after they're running, right? So you have to have all the code up and running and working before you can do these tests. Then it's kind of already too late, you know, kind of in, in our opinion, the bug is already in the system versus preventing it in the first place with static code analysis. All right, so why does, why does using static code analysis actually help? Well, it, it increases productivity you have developers because you don't have to write all those test cases or set up the stubs or you know, do anything anything tricky with getting all the, the harnesses working and database uh, mock data and, and stub protocols and all that up and going. You can just run it immediately as is on your code base. Now, that doesn't mean you're, you don't want to also have dynamic analysis, but Static code analysis is the place to start, and it's, it's a lot faster and easier to get going. Examples, uh, Lawrence and Livermore, a big uh, national lab, you know, saved $200,000 by using static code analysis on a fairly small uh, project. You know, a lot of these programs have millions and millions of lines of code, or even, you know, if you look at a, a modern 
car today, there's hundreds of millions of lines of code that goes in the infotainment systems and, and other systems in the vehicle. Uh, so those are large projects, but you can save a good amount of money even on small projects. You know, here's another example of saving uh, some money even on a small uh, pilot project. Lockheed Martin says that only one critical defect per year per developer needs to be found to give complete return on investment for static code analysis. You know, other companies say that they see 20% bug reduction in, in the Internet of Things space. Or yet others open spans that they've got a CWE, which is a security standard, top 25 compliance. Right? So they're complying with the top 25 CWE uh, issues by running static code analysis. So there's a lot of things, a lot of improvements you can get in, in money to be saved uh, by using these tools. It's also important because of what can go wrong if you don't use static code analysis. Here's an example uh, last year from Boeing. Uh, there's a, a, a software bug right, that caused total loss of electrical power after 248 days. So basically the plane just turns off because there was a bug where there was a, a counter that overflowed after 248 days and wrapped around a zero, which reset uh, the power and basically could, could take a plane out of the sky. That's in, incredibly dangerous. Would have been caught easily with static code analysis. Another example uh, last year, uh, a software glitch uh, basically let a bunch of prisoners out of prison early, you know, a month and a half early. Uh, again, something that could have been caught easily with static code analysis, you know, that dangerous things can happen. And it, earlier this year, a lot of people might remember this Nest smart thermostat had a software up, update with a glitch in it that basically caused the batteries to drain and heat went off in January, which in a lot of places, you know, that can be very dangerous, dangerous for, you know, the elderly, for example. Uh, now, this is a bug that took a few weeks to show up out in the real world, and it affected 2.5 million thermostats just in the U.S. And, of course, it leads to a lot of unhappy uh, users and, and complaints on, on Twitter and elsewhere. So there's a lot of brand damage that can, can occur for something like that. So um, using static code analysis can, can save money and increase developer productivity, but can also prevent some of these, you know, kind of public black eyes you can get by having something go wrong. All right, so what can't static code analysis do? So some things are just out of scope. For example, it can't verify runtime behavior. Right? It's, it's static code analysis is occurring before the code runs, right? So we never execute the code. So you can't actually prove that the code does what you want it to do. Right? You have to run the code to make sure that that's the case. You can't verify that the, the code is written to match how it was designed to be written. Right? So we're not checking the behavior to make sure it's as expected. You still need a QA department. You still have to test to make sure that the code does what it's supposed to do. But of course, uh, STA can find issues that lead to discovering design flaws. For example, we can determine that code is never going to be reached. So there's probably an issue there with the design of the code. And then finally, new static code analysis can't prove that the system will actually work or not. And therefore, for safety critical systems, like in the, in the automotive industry, um, you can't rely only on static analysis to say, yeah, this, this vehicle is safe, that the software works as expected. Um, so it helps. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. You still have to do other forms of code analysis. And kind of a, a final limitation is that static code analysis, like all other kinds of analysis, is not absolutely foolproof, right? It will occasionally de report defects that aren't actually a problem. And the industry think, refers to these as false positives. It says, yep, you said there was a bug. We looked into it, and it turns out we don't think it's actually a bug. So this, I don't think this is something to be afraid of. It's just uh, something to be aware of. And as an example, back to our grammar uh, ex uh, sample here, we could say, is this a problem? If, if the, the static code analysis tool 
back to our grammar check example, see something like buffalo, buffalo, buffalo again and again and again, it points it out, hey, that's a potential defect. There's a bunch of repeat words here. But the, the sentence is actually grammatically correct. Bicelo, bison from Buffalo, New York, who are intimidated by other bison in Buffalo, New York, also happen to intimidate other bison in Buffalo, New York. So there's a lot of synonyms there, like bison and buffalo. And in this context, our, you know, our, our quote static uh, code analysis tool might say, hey, that looks like a bunch of repetition. You could determine that that's actually fine. And that's how you, you intended to write that sentence or that code. But it's probably not a bad idea to still have that pointed out to you that, hey, you might want to take a look. This is a little bit strange. Okay, so now we've kind of covered the basics of what it can and, and can't do. Let's talk about the five best practices around uh, using static code analysis. So first one is to use it for security. Right? Uh, as we know, we see it in the news all the time. Every week there's another uh, major hack and vulnerability and data loss, it seems. So organizations have trouble preventing attacks. And that can be due to lack of time, lack of focus, don't have developers don't have the right tools, but whatever it is, it's happening. And we did our own survey uh, not too long ago from 1,700 developers and found that 80% of them incorrectly answered key questions around protecting sensitive data. And you matched that with another survey we did not too long ago that found that about two-thirds of developers think they are personally responsible for the security in the code, and you come up with a bad situation. Right. They're responsible for doing it, but they're answering basic quote, co uh, questions incorrectly, and they don't have the time and focus and tooling to do it. So no surprise that these issues keep happening. And a lot of these breaches result from input trust issues. You, basically, developers are, are not being suspicious enough of input that comes into, the, into their programs. And that leads to cross-site scripting issues, SQL injection, unvalidated input which lead to issues that make the worldwide news like heart bleed uh, caused by buffer overruns and the BMW car patch, right? That they had a, a security flag that, that wasn't set. So in the heart bleed case, because we, we brought that up a number of times and it made such big news around the world, this is something where a, a static code analysis would have very quickly found the issue and told the developer how to fix it, that it was a buffer over overrun, that a particular value wasn't being checked before it was being used and it, and it caused um, basically the, the code to access memory that wasn't safe to access and therefore a hacker could insert bad code uh, into that location and cause a lot of, of uh, damage. It looks like might have just dropped out real quick here. So we're switched over to the second poll. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get my slide showing again in a moment, but let's do this poll in the meantime. So what tools and techniques are you currently using to protect yourself from security vulnerabilities? Are you doing penetration testing, typically automated? Are you using static code analysis or dynamic analysis? Or real-time security event management, look, basically looking at, at security logs, et cetera, or do you not look for security vulnerabilities today? So we'll give everybody a few seconds to answer that. So I don't know what's jumping out at you, um, Rod, but uh, the fact that more than 1% of people said that they don't look for security vulnerabilities is very surprising to me. Yeah, and that's that's a lot more than zero, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a, a sixth of the, of the people say they don't look at all. So if, if you don't look for them, you're probably not going to find them, I guess would be the first, first response. Um, I, I think... That's that's probably pretty scary, but it's it's also a little strange. There, there were more um, more of the other answers as well. More you know penetration testing, I think is is pretty common, and that was the top answer. Uh, but I, I would think I would see a little more static and dynamic code analysis as well. 
I would say, that, you know, the, the first response is if you're not looking at all, then really the key is to, to take to your management or if you're in management to build up the case to spend that and effort and focus uh, because you, you will be bitten. It's just a matter of when, not if, right? The, the hackers are out there. They only need to find one way in. You have to stop all the ways in all the time. So it will happen. It's, it's guaranteed. But that's, that's no excuse for ignoring the problem and kind of hoping it will go away. Uh, you you got to do your due diligence, put the, the tooling and the practices and the, the, the time, uh, set it aside to, to to really focus on this critical issue. And as we'll see later when we talk about the results of not doing this, um, there, there can be a serious brand uh, impact to, uh, to getting bit by this and not uh, not protecting yourself correctly. Okay, good, good poll. Okay, second best practice is to use SCA to enforce standards. So if, if you need to comply with either industry standards, which are, are getting to be more and more common in a lot of industries, or for regulatory compliance, or even for your own internal policies, it's a lot faster and easier to use static code analysis than to try to do this by hand, right? And it does complement your existing QA approach. It doesn't replace it, right? So you don't have to change anything there. You simply add a, a, an automated, repeatable analysis to the process uh, to get to get much faster, better results. And the kinds of industry standards that can be supported with, with SCA are you know, DESA STIG, that's more of a, of a military defense industry standard, CWEs, which are security vulnerabilities, uh, common weakness enumeration, kind of applies to everybody in, in almost all industries. MISRA, which is more automotive heavy, but it's start, starting to expand to, uh, to other areas, uh, CERT, and other OWASP, DO-178B, those are all security related. Uh, even FDA has, uh, has their own validation for things like you know, robotic arms. And, and the list goes on. But there's a lot of these standards that can be enforced and manually uh, automatically checked with compliance reports created by these, uh, these SCA tools. So you don't have to spend you know, countless thousands of, of person hours uh, reading through code and doing this by hand when you have good tooling to support you. Hey, Rod, I uh, just want to jump in. It seems that your slide share is not working. Uh, we're, not, we're not seeing your slides. Okay, thanks for pointing that out. Let me... Oh, there you go. Hop back over here. Great. So is that better? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Th yeah, thanks for letting me know. So I'll let, I'll let people absorb that slide for just a, a moment that I was talking through. So those are the kinds of standards, uh, the SEA tools support. Save you a lot of time and effort to use one of these versus going through lots of manual uh, work by hand. Okay, so third best practice uh, is around integrating SCA with your CI, with your continuous integration environment. Now, CI, and again back to our first poll results, not everybody is there yet. So really what we mean by that is you know, continuously merging and testing each developer change into the main code base. So every time a developer adds one feature, fix one, one bug, uh, that change is tested in the context of the rest of the system automatically and immediately and so that the developer can get very quick feedback if they, basically if they broke something. And to make sure those changes work with all the other changes that are happening from the other developers as it comes in. It's really the key to not wait until, you know, a month three months down the road to do an integration and then find lots of things are broken and have to go re repatch and fix things up. So benefits, I, I think, are pretty powerful here and, and quanti uh, quantified. Of a, you know, we, we're seeing a 90% increase in the line of code output from each developer when they do a daily build. That's huge. So that's a, a, you know, almost doubling. You know, that's like hiring half the number of developers to get the same results or doing twice as much with what you've got. Also, almost a third reduction in the defect rate when you're doing this at every check-in. Right? So it, it fits very well in the Agile process you know, to have that rapid feedback cycle 
and, and improve as you go along. And to see this in kind of a, a pictorial form, this is a lot going on in this diagram, but if you if you look over on the uh, kind of the bottom right side, we see developer two checks in some changes at step one into the source control server, whether it's Git or Subversion or CVS or Perforce, what have you. When that change goes into the system, it can trigger your continuous integration system to pull those new changes from source code control to run your build, and hopefully that's an incremental build that's, that's very fast and only has to take into account the changes, uh, runs your tests, all the automated unit tests and functional tests, et cetera, and your static code analysis would fit in this part of the, the, uh, the process. Then the, whether it fails or succeeds, the continuous integration server would notify uh, people, especially when something fails. What you want is to have an almost immediate um, notification to the developer who broke the build, essentially. Uh, hey, you just checked in this code. You've introduced a, a critical new safety or security or compliance defect or quality defect. Um, fix it. And we've seen a lot of uh, large enterprises that ad adopt this, especially in like uh, mobile handsets and in, in other companies where they've got a lot, uh, a lot of very complex moving parts in their builds. They will actually fail the build if their static code analysis tool detects a critical defect. So if a developer adds a new feature, the SEA tool says, yep, found a critical bug, that's equivalent to breaking the build as if the code didn't even compile. It'll reject it, make the developer fix it before it goes into code base. So that's their way of keeping the code clean. And I think that's a good best practice regardless of kind of what industry you're in. Once you adopt static code analysis for all the benefits we're talking about today, sometimes you might not want to go back and, and immediately try to find and fix all the bugs in your code base on day one. You, you want to tackle those over time and prioritize. But what you do want is to prevent critical new issues from going in the code base from that day forward. So you would say, okay, as of now, um, these are the things that we consider equivalent to breaking the build, these kinds of defects. So developers, if you add them, um, you're going to have to fix your code before you can even basically get it to, to be checked in. So I think that's a very powerful thing to do, and it's working well in, in the industry today. All right. So we went through these steps. So the keys to successful continuous integration uh, um, with static code analysis, you have to have it completely automated. I think that's really the key, right? You can't wait for sysadmins or developers or release engineers or anybody else to come run this by hand as a separate manual step in the process. It's got to be triggered by your CI system as developers check in code. It has to be scalable, right? So minimal resources it needs to, to deploy everywhere your CI uh, agents or, or builds can run. It needs to, to be able to scale up just as fast and as easily as your CI system. And I think this is a real key one. The speed, you know, people think of speed as, okay, it's, it's a nice to have. It's really not. If you think of a true agile development environment, uh, you want to keep the developers always in context, in flow as they're writing code. If they write code, check it in, and have to wait a week to find out that there's a critical defect and it got rejected, you know, they, they've completely lost context and they have to sort of bootstrap their brain to get back into that code and see how it works in order to fix it. So you want instant feedback, which means only analyzing the code that's changed or affected by the latest change, not everything if you've got, you know, million line code base. You, you can't afford to scan all that and, and spend hours doing it. And the last key is it's got to be relevant. Right. You've got to only show the developers the things that they're impacting, they're affecting. Don't show them every bug in the system because they, they wrote five new lines of code. Show them only the ones that pertain to the changes they just made. That's, uh, those are the real keys to success. The fourth practice is you know, using static code analysis to validate the legacy code in your code base in the open source you're using. 
right? You've probably got code written by contractors, maybe even an, an offshore development partner. You've got legacy code in your system, been around for years. You've got code from ISVs. You've got lots of different places the code comes from, not just the code your developers write. In fact, you're probably writing only 10 to 15% of the code that's going in your system. The rest comes from somewhere else. So SCA can be used to test and validate all that other code you're bringing in uh, to make sure that you you understand the critical defects and, and can work with them or around them uh, before you put them into your code base and cause yourself problems. Because again, it's much cheaper to fix uh, early on in development than it is once you're in the field and in production. And then the, the fifth and, and final and best practice is SCA can also help your developers become better developers to write better code. So it's an educational tool. It will find you know, common errors and problems in security vulnerabilities and issues where you're out of compliance with standards. It will show the developers the problem and also help them understand why it's a defect and how to fix it. And so that makes your developers better every day. And if you can give them this capability right at their desktop, so it's almost you know, as they type, like the grammar checker, spells checker we talked about before. So, you know, if they're seeing the little squiggle underline, hey, you've just introduced a security issue, just like a grammar checker would show you, that's the perfect time to do it. Because they're in flow, they're in context, they're thinking about the problem, they can immediately see and understand why the issue is an issue, fix it by, by backspacing and typing a little bit, and bam, they're on to the next thing. So they, they've improved, they'll, they'll avoid that in the future, and the code is cleaner because of it. So that's a, a great best practice. So to summarize the five best practices, use SCA for security. You know, find vulnerabilities before they go into production. You know, I mentioned earlier about uh, brand damage. You know, Forrester says that if you're, you're a, a large corporation, you know, if you're in the, the Fortune 500, over 80% of the value of your company is actually intangible. It's, it's around the brand. It's the trust that your customers and partners have with you in the marketplace. You know, a, a critical security uh, vulnerability, data loss, breach, you're violating trust and confidentiality, and that can take a major, uh, make a major impact on your brand and therefore your, your stock price. Enforce standards with SCA. You know, get those uh, compliance needs that you have, get those boxes checked in the easiest, fastest way possible. Integrate with your CI system so that you consider static code analysis just another one of the tests that must always run every time code changes and you must get a green, uh, everything is working status before you move forward. That always keeps the code clean. Validate legacy code and open source. So check all the code in your code base before you release, not just the code your developers write, which is a, a small percentage of the whole. And then finally, help your developers be better developers uh, by basically training them as they write code with the benefits that come, that come with that. So the last slide here before we spend a few minutes in Q&A is to look at uh, clockwork, and that's uh, Rogue Wave's continuous static code analysis tool. So we have built-in support for CI with continuous static code analysis that works with all the major uh, CI tools like Jenkins, for example. We have on-the-fly analysis, like I talked about that grammar spell checker. So as developers type, we're uh, literally as they type the code, it's, it's uh, showing them where they're introducing uh, security, compliance, or quality issues so they can find and fix it instantly. They can be compliant with all those standards that, that might pertain to your industry, or if your industry doesn't have uh, a standard that's required, you can easily adopt uh, one of these others uh, to make sure you have better code. We've got hundreds and hundreds of built-in checkers that go far beyond uh, just these industry standards. Uh, we've got a unique analysis engine. It finds defects that no other SCAA tool on the market can find. And we've got the widest compiler support. Right? Basically, if you're writing code with it, we can handle it. And if you do find a need to extend or customize uh, 
the set of rules that you want to use when you're analyzing your code. We have a nice UI tool that makes it very easy to write your own uh, new rules, new checkers, so that you can make sure your own uh, your own compliance needs are met. It could be your own style, could be something specific to your code or issues you've run across in the field and production, and you want to bake that right into the SEA tool up front, you can do that. And then finally, we've got support for uh, process certification, uh, ISO 26262, functional safety. So if you're in automotive or one of those areas, uh, we can make it really easy for you to, to be compliant and prove that you are compliant with the re proper reports. So that's kind of what we do and how we help and why static code analysis of any kind is so important for your, your apps today. So let's see if, if we have uh, any questions. Great, Rod. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody, if you want to ask a question now, to just uh, type it into the control panel, hit submit, and again, we'll get to as many as time lets us. So kicking it right off, uh, the first question is, uh, so how do you decide between using static analysis and dynamic analysis? Okay, so I think the, the easy answer is start with static analysis because it applies basically to any problem, right? It's, it's all about having the code start clean and then go from there. Dynamic analysis is most useful when you have to go above and beyond that and prove that the runtime behavior of the system meets your spec. Maybe that could be for performance reasons. Maybe it could be um, you know, specific functional safety or other requirements where it's, it's absolutely mandatory, or it could be for security reasons like penetration testing, uh, for example, where you need to have uh, a runtime check to make sure that uh, th that you can show your your auditors, your compliance people that um, we've prevented the most common hacks through our system. Uh, I would say those are the main needs for dynamic analysis, but static analysis is a place to start because you don't have to write any, any new code or any new tests or come up with harnesses or mocks or, or proxies or anything that's, that kind of complicates the environment. It just kind of works out of the box. Excellent. Okay. Um, so uh, the next question would be, um, so what programming languages does the, does, uh, the tool support? Okay. Um, so Clockwork works with C, C++, Java, and C Sharp. And we find that the, the vast majority uh, of our customers are in the uh, C, C++ space, typically uh, embedded, you know, mission critical type apps, uh, like I mentioned, automotive, defense, uh, health, healthcare, health, like uh, robotic arms and, and the like. Uh, things where if, uh, if the software goes down, crashes, then people get hurt or you lose a lot of money. Those, are, are kind of the real strengths for us, and, and that those types of environments tend to be more heavily uh, C, C++ or Java or C Sharp. Mm -hmm. So on the on the same kind of uh, the same note, so is there integration with Team Foundations uh, server builds? Uh, yeah, we 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 support uh, Team Foundation server and um, and lots of other tools. Um, we we support all the major IDEs. You know, Eclipse and Visual Studio and IntelliJ and others, uh, as as well as um, the build tools, the Jenkins and Team City and Team Foundation Server and, and all the source code control uh, systems as well. Right. So uh, another question is, can the tool work with SQL stored procedure codes? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I've had that question before. It's interesting. We I don't believe we would actually analyze the stored procedure code itself, but we would analyze the code that uh, integrates with the stored procedures. So the code that calls the stored procedures and, and uh, processes the results, uh, we would analyze that. Right. Excellent. So along those lines, uh, that, uh, sorry, I was going to say along those lines, we do have um, support for detecting SQL injection as well, which is the, the most common vulnerability. Uh, basically every year in web apps, we, we have ways to detect and prevent those issues. Uh -huh. Very good. 
Um, so uh, the next question is, is there a lot of resource overhead when using static code analysis? Um, so uh, there's, there's a couple places you can run the static code analysis. You can do it uh, on the developer desktop as a writing code. And there is a little bit of overhead there. I mean, you, you want to make sure you have a, a relatively um, a strong developer workstation with enough memory and CPU, et cetera. I think it's you know, probably the overhead of 15% you know, or something CPU-wise. Um, on the build side, if you're going to deploy static code analysis with your CI servers, um, then again, there, there's a little overhead. It's doing analysis kind of comparable to running your, your other uh, unit tests and other automated tests. So as long as your environment is, is uh, kind of equipped and, and scales out enough to handle all the rest of your tests, you should be uh, fine to run static code analysis as well. Excellent. Okay. Uh, another of uh, the attendees uh, asks if uh, Clockwork, again, on back to the theme of what does it work with, so does Clockwork analyze any of the .NET frameworks, uh, you know, Windows Presentation Foundation, uh, Link, you know, things like that? Uh, yeah, so we do work with uh, C Sharp code in, in .NET frameworks, and we have what we call uh, knowledge bases, which are, are ways that we kind of uh, preload or that you can preload um, knowledge of, of certain libraries like the, the .NET, the foundation classes, so that uh, Clockwork knows about them when, and then when you're calling into those classes in the framework, you don't have to have you know, all the source be uh, analyzed every time. It can already kind of know how that code works and how you interact with it. Mm -hmm. Great. So one of the attendees wants to know how this compares with tools like FXCOP or SonarCube. Okay. So for something like FXCOP, SonarCube, um, you know, some of the tools out there, you know, without directly uh, kind of picking on anybody, but, you know, I'd say FXCOP, they tend to be a little more, uh, I would say, lightweight tools. They're looking more at at syntax and uh, it, it kind of what I, what I think of as kind of the the introductory level static code analysis, right? They're looking uh, in in a particular file. They're looking for issues that would come up maybe if you call one function from another, and they're looking at you know spacing and braces and indentation and, and kind of the superficial type things. Whereas I think what what really sets Clockwork apart from from most the, the competitors out there like that is that it does the, the very deep, robust analysis where we can find, uh, for example, that an entire call graph that touches you know, dozens of your source code files and hundreds of in, include headers, uh, we can find that the interaction of all those things causes an issue when your code uses it in a certain way with certain parameters that could cause you to crash or have a security vulnerability at runtime. Those are the kind of things Clockwork can detect that really those, those more lightweight tools really don't even attempt uh, that level of analysis. It's, it's just kind of beyond what they were built for. Right. Excellent. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, the, the next uh, question, I guess, would be, uh, is there a trial version available, and what are the licensing models for, uh, for Clockwork? Uh, okay. So yeah, um, there there is a, uh, a trial available. I think we'll we would ask um, if you want to do a trial to, to contact us, and we can uh, you know get you get you started on the right process with the, the keys, etc. Um, the licensing model for Clockwork. So there's the as I mentioned before, there's the server component. So if you want to run Clockwork on your build server. And then there's also the, the developer seat. So it's typically uh, licensed in, in that way by developer seat and, and by build servers. And then if you've got a, uh, you want to integrate with your continuous integration environment, there's a you know, kind of module that works with that as well. But we'd, we'd love to uh, have our, our, you know, someone in sales talk to you specifically if, if you've got the licensing questions. Right. Uh, so we're uh, just about coming up on the hour, so this would be the last call for questions. 
Uh, and uh, we do have a few more minutes, so we will be able to answer them. But um, we want to, uh, you know, get uh, as many of these answered as we can. So the next question is: Do I just plug the source code into this tool for analysis, or what do I need to write or embed in code or in the project to get it analyzed properly? Uh, okay. So the good news there is you don't have to write anything in the code. You don't have to embed uh, any directives or anything like that. Basically, you don't have to touch your code at all. Um, when you run Clockwork, it's actually very uh, smart. It will watch your ex your current build process and and how your your existing scripts uh, compile and link and, and get everything working. And then it can analyze your code and, and give you results. You don't have to touch a, a single line of your source code to make that happen. And you don't have to change your build or your configuration. It's, yeah, it's, it's a really uh, powerful benefit. Right. So uh, I, I guess the final question will be, so can you customize static code analysis for your own rules? Uh, yes. So if you, for example, if you're in, uh, you're in a situation where you've, you've, you've been using static analysis and you have the uh, default checkers and things turned on and you're getting good results, but maybe there's a certain, um, a certain thing that your developers are doing. Maybe they're using uh, a legacy library that's internal to your company that you've deprecated. You don't want them to use that anymore. You can uh, use our GUI tool and very easily write a new rule, a new checker as we call it, that will look specifically for that, that old library you don't want somebody to use. It will flag that as, as a warning to tell a developer, hey, stop using this, use this other thing instead. So that's, that's a great, uh, easy example of how you can build that. But you can also write uh, very sophisticated checkers looking for um, basically anything you want to in, in the code as well. But most, most uh, of our customers use it for things that are specific to their organization as opposed to you know, generic code issues. Fantastic. All, all right. Uh, so, uh, Rod, with just about uh, a minute to go, uh, if you would uh, summarize, or uh, you know, if there's one or two key takeaways you want people to uh, leave this uh, uh, this presentation, uh, what would those be? Okay. Well, I think the polling questions kind of pointed out to me that um, there, there's still work to be done in the industry, right? We we need to use um, continuous integration. We need to use static code analysis, and we need to actually look for security vulnerabilities. I think uh, right now uh, a lot of people I think would kind of just wish they would go away and unfortunately that's not going to happen and it, it does require time and effort to fix but y you know you, you can invest in this in a tool like this you can integrate it in your system and you can get great results without a lot of you know uh, without a ton of time and effort and money uh, doing it by hand is, is a lot tougher very very good all right, so I'd like to take this time now to thank uh, all of our attendees today for, uh, for tuning in and listening to the, uh, to the webinar. Uh, and, of course, uh, thanks to you, Rod, for, for an excellent presentation. And uh, thanks to Rogue Wave Software, who, um, who sponsored uh, today's uh, webinar. So uh, until uh, the next one, this is Dave Rubenstein, Editor-in-Chief of SD Times, saying so long, and we'll see you next time.